Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another special edition of the show. I finally made it to Messina Hof. It only took me a couple more months and it was because I had this great uh, opportunity to come out to Houston, uh, which you saw last week with Kevin Zraeli at uh, the Brunello tasting. So um, I made sure I made a point to come out here to Bryan, Texas to, uh, to visit uh, Messina Hof. And uh, this is a winery that I've been meaning to come to and wanting to come to for a very long time. Uh, an icon of Texas wineries, and uh, I really, uh, really appreciate uh, these gentlemen here uh, opening up the facilities for me and giving me a tour. So let's get some introductions. Uh, I've got Paul and Paul Bonarigo. Uh, so why don't we get your introductions, and uh, we'll start from there. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm Paul, the fifth generation uh, winemaker, and. This is Paul the sixth generation winemaker. That's your cue. <laughs> I'm the sixth generation winemaker. I'm feeling older all the time now. And, uh, and, and Paul is the seventh, seventh generation winemaker because we have an eighth generation winemaker in uh, Paul Anthony who just uh, came out of the uh, oven as uh, Steve Warren in our other facility. Called. Yes. Uh, so, uh, but it's a pleasure to have you. and. Uh, so things are fun here at Messina Hof. Uh, here we have a little bit more uh, things that we offer uh, because we've been here for 35 years. We started Messina Hof in 1977 and mm -hmm. my wife, Meryl, uh, who is the Hof of Messina Hof, uh, she claims she's the better Hof of Messina Hof. And so, <laughs> I like that. And, and you know, after 36 years of marriage, uh, I accept, I accept. <laughs> And uh, so we started and, uh, in 77 with the planting of a one acre vineyard. It led to the production of about 1,300 gallons of wine. And now we have um, a very lovely restaurant that we're sitting in. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have wonderful cuisine here, steaks, seafood, uh, operate from Wednesday through Sunday. We have a great tasting room where we operate seven days a week. There, our, our take on the tasting room is a little different than most of the wineries in the state. We do about uh, 35 to 40 minutes of wine education. We teach people about the wine industry and about Messina Hof, and then we take them on a tour of the facility. So we take them to our villa, which is a four diamond uh, facility, 11 rooms. All the rooms are a different uh, period and a different uh, country so we do Italy and France and Germany and it's a fun place to stay because when you stay there you feel like you're in 11 different experiences um, and then uh, in the uh, we also show the vineyard of course we have 30 acres of grapes on the property yeah, which is uh, right behind us right behind you should be able to see a little bit mm -hmm. of it and and you may even see some of our staff today because they're actually pruning this side this side of the vineyard okay um, and uh, so we're pruning our Lenoir grapes the vineyard was planted in 1983 and uh, so it's developing some wonderful complexity and that's what goes into our dessert style wines we do ports Sherry's, uh, we do a rosé from this vineyard. So we make seven different products from this one 30-acre uh, plot. Um, and then in the uh, back of the uh, facility, we have a beautiful barrel room. And in the uh, barrel room, we have about 750 barrels. In the restaurant, we have about 200 barrels. So uh, we have quite a few barrels on the property because we make a lot of red wine. Now, are these, these, I didn't ask, but the barrels, I'm pointing over there because that's where the room is. Are those active barrels? Are those, those are actually, they're all they have full. wine in them? They're all full. And that's one so of, cool. <laughs> one of the things we do is when a person comes to dine here, we check them out because if they look suspicious, we don't let them sit next to the barrel. <laughs> you know, because especially if they ask for a straw or a siphon, right. we get pretty nervous about that. And uh, so... Uh, 
but yeah, they're all full. As a matter of fact, every January, uh, Paul is uh, responsible for exchanging the barrels. So what he does is he picks the barrels that are coming in, and they're typically some of the newer vintages, and then the ones that uh, are ready to get bottled come out, and it's a swap every January. So um, it's a lovely facility to be able to sit, have wonderful food, and have barrels sitting there. That's awesome. Um, to, kind of, to kind of go on that, um, I'm currently, as I tweeted like yesterday, it takes me weeks to read a book. I'm reading a book about Beaujolais, and um, one of the stories is that uh, in, in, when there's a wedding, the, the bride's family hosts the, hosts the party, and apparently it's like a, like a 24-hour event, mm -hmm. okay? And they, they, so they make, they make wine, right? So they bring a barrel, and they get it, and they just, they just you know, take the, take the bung out, and they, just, and they just pour it right from the barrel for the party. And when that barrel runs out, they bring out another one. So. Wow, that is, we haven't quite evolved to that yeah. point yet, but uh, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, that, that book's just been, been absolutely amazing. So um, uh, it started off as like just kind of funny little stories and then it became to, into history. So uh, I've been floored by that book, but just talking about the barrels reminded me of that little thing. So I wanted to interject that real quick. <laughs> and, and, and during the week, uh, people will dine for lunch and actually see our guys topping the barrels and doing their barrel work. So okay. it's a working barrel room. So uh, it's, it's fun for the customers. That's pretty cool. And you're talking about, um, so you have the staff pruning uh, today. So I think maybe that's something good to talk about where, you know, the vine is, is all year. It's not just, okay, it's winter time, there's nothing to pick, so you just leave it alone. So what, what's the purpose uh, for those of us that don't do any viticulture or horticulture? What's the purpose of really pruning uh, the vines? What does that do? Why don't you handle that? Because we did a workshop last week and Paul right. oh, did the perfect. workshop. Yes. <clears throat> Just, um, of course, during the pruning process is whenever you're prepping the vineyard uh, for, the, for the next growing season and you're reestablishing the vine balance. So uh, we prune the vines back uh, to two buds. Um, a lot of people uh, who've never seen a vineyard before, that can be a shocking experience to see that because you're taking off a tremendous amount of the top growth. Um, but that sets up the vine for the next year to be able to put the proper focus on the fruit. So okay. whenever you have a vine that you don't prune enough, um, then it focuses too much on growing the canopy and not enough on the fruit. So um, we're actually very fortunate here because of the um, because of the vine, the Lenoir grape, and the soil and the environment that we have, we're able to get very high sugar content out of our grapes. So we get very good quality grapes from this vineyard. And that's and this is why I love coming to the to the wineries because I don't get this type of information and education by just reading the books. You know, it, it, this is why I like to come out here because I get to hear stuff like this. I'm like, oh, pruning. Okay, I know it's done, and I, I do know it's done. I know that there's stuff that's done during the during the course of the year, but it's good to me to find out the reasons why. I just, that's why I love coming out. <laughs> and, and a winemaker really uh, is highly interested in the way the vineyard is pruned mm -hmm. because it really does set up the vineyard for the quality factor in the next season. Uh, a vineyard that is unpruned produces horrible fruit and uh, eventually kills the vineyard. So mm -hmm. it's, it's essential, it's really an important part. Exactly, see? Told you. <laughs> that's why I come out. That's why I come out to the wineries. Like I say I don't get that information. Um, so you've got uh, so we've got the facility here, and then you've got the barrel room, uh, which got all the barrels. And you do some parties in there, right? Yes, we do weddings. A lot of weddings. Okay. I, I am a preacher, so I officiate weddings, and we love doing weddings because uh, you know the, the beautiful thing about our business is the fact that we are there for all of life's joyful moments. So we have anniversaries, birthday parties, weddings, uh, all sorts of festive occasions. And uh, we ho host them in different venues. We have a, a rose garden, so in nice spring weather, we do mm -hmm. it in the rose garden. We have a lovely gazebo where Paul was married, and it's on the other side of our lake where it's beautiful. It's a, it's a, a stream that runs through the, uh, the vineyard. and. Uh, and we host weddings there, and then we have the barrel rooms. We have two that we mm -hmm. use. And then upstairs, we have another facility where it's, uh, we host dances, and it's a beautiful wooden floor. So 
you know, we could do four or five events in one one time, and that's what that's what we're all about. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so we're gonna have five wines here. Now these are definitely different wines than we had, where I had. I'm sorry, over up in Fredericksburg, and um, uh, these are these are special, pretty much. These these are these are these are gonna be some special wines here. Um, we're gonna start with with the Primitivo over here. Yes. Right. Okay, and this is the 2011. There we go. Yes, 2011 Primitivo. It's a variety that we probably started producing about four years ago. Okay. And uh, you know, it's the con the uh, kin to uh, Zinfandel, and we're going to be having the Zinfandel a little later. But okay. uh, the Paolo, oh, yeah. the Paolo line is a line that we consider to be world class. So this wine. Um, actually, its junior partner, the uh, private reserve, uh, was uh, judged by uh, Gaiat as one of the four best Primitivos in the world. So this is a step above that. So uh, it's a lovely, lovely example of Primitivo. Uh, we grow it in the High Plains. Uh, mm -hmm. The vineyard is called Ciro Santo, which I believe is uh, the uh, blood of Christ. Okay. And, um, and the uh, the grower is a uh, preacher, and uh, so he, and it's a beautiful vineyard. It's located very close to the Lubbock Airport. Okay, and um, so you're using the Primitivo name rather than Zinfandel because are these are these cuttings directly from Italy. Yeah, the, these okay. went through the Davis program, and they are deemed uh, Primitivo. They have the little genetic difference than Zinfandel and. Uh, and again, when we go through the wines and we get to the Zinfandel, uh, we might want to keep this one Absolutely. aside and okay. smell the difference because they're different. There's no doubt about it. All right. Get some nice dark fruit on it. And some vanilla, some spices. The thing that I love about uh, Primitivo is that it it has a lot of berry, strong berry flavors, you know, and uh, and the uh, the wine is not <coughs> high acid, so it's it's very soft. Um, it goes absolutely wonderful with pasta. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is my favorite pasta wine. This and some nice Italian sausage, you know. Wow. I mean, that, that's the way to enjoy pasta, you know, so. Do you get some good Italian sausage out here? Well, you probably do, because, yeah. You know, yeah, but. we have a lot of Italians in Brazos County, and they make uh, the, uh, the the sausage with anise. Okay. You know, with, the, with a little bit of anise in it, and it really is nice. Now, when you when you first moved to Texas, you found it was really difficult to get anything good Italian-wise, food? And Very hard. Yeah. Very hard. Yeah. We, we, <clears throat> we felt, we moved here in 72. And it was it was a struggle to find anything. We, there was a there was a delicatessen in San Antonio that uh, specialized. You know, it was an Italian delicatessen, so we were able to get some good stuff there. But it was definitely uh, uh, stories of growing up and going into the HEB, going to the grocery store and asking for things that were normal in Jersey. It's like they looked at you like, "What are you talking about? Like, you're a foreign <laughs> language, basically." So. And then over the years, it's gotten much better. And where in Jersey? We, uh, we well, I was, uh, we were up in North Jersey. I was born in Palisades, well, actually I wasn't born in Palisades Park, but I live in Palisades Park. Um, my father's from there, my mother's from uh, Central Jersey, uh, Jersey City and Lodi, and then we moved down south to uh, Beechwood, south of Tom's River. Um, well, we, so, we grew up five miles apart. Well, I didn't I, grow I'm up from, there. Because <laughs> I, I grew up in Tenafly, New Jersey. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I we moved down here and I was four years old, so I, I but made frequent visits up to Jersey mm -hmm. um, and going into the city and all that. So that was always a fun fun time. But uh, growing up in San Antonio, it was like there's nothing Italian here. The Columbus, you know, the Crystal Columbus Society was there, but that but they didn't really do much. Well, I didn't think they did much. Maybe they did. <laughs> no offense, guys. I just we just weren't we just weren't part of that community. We would occasionally do stuff with them, but it wasn't like really living up in a, in a large Italian yes. community. So uh -huh. but anyway, so I have a, I had to have a love of Italian wines and food. And that's what I did last night. We went to uh, grotto last night, uh, had some amazing food over there. 
but yeah, you, um, on, on the palate, it's it's definitely lots of fruit, lots of nice dark fruit on it. And uh, like I said, there isn't, it's not really high acid at all. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't attack, doesn't attack your tongue. Um, like the Brunellos were wonderful, by the way, but very high acid. Um, so definitely a different style. And the nice thing about this site, it's about 3,600 feet of elevation. And uh, it really does get cool at night. Mm -hmm. So it really has some nice uh, deflection from daytime high to evening low. Uh, the vineyard is kept perfectly. I mean, there's no, um, nothing but perfectly managed uh, vineyard. It's just a beautiful vineyard. And then we, uh, we age this in French oak and American oak, so it gives it a little bit of variety in the, in the oak tones. Okay. And, um, and it, we can't keep it in stock. It's one of those things that as soon as we bottle it, uh, two months later, it's all gone. So. Now is this really done well. is this kind of like the double barrel that, that I had at Fredericksburg, where you do a set period of time of all of it in one style, and then you switch to a different, or is they are they are they they uh, age at the same time in the in the different oaks? Yeah, we we double barrel age all of the private reserves on up. Okay, and this is the step above the private reserves. Okay, um, so. That's kind of different because when, when Steve was telling me about that, it was, I don't think I'd ever really ever heard anyone aging for a period of time and then swapping the type of barrel. Um, what was the inspiration for that? Well, it, it's layered complexity. That's, okay. that's what the inspiration was. You know, it's kind of like, again, I, I always think of winemaking like my Italian cooking. You know, I, I would hate to, for someone to say to me, you can only use garlic. I like to put garlic, basil, a little oregano, and, and, a, and a French oak barrel definitely has a different flavor profile than an American oak barrel. Right. So when you use both, they don't conflict, they basically layer. So you have, oh, I pick up this, then I pick up this, and it, it makes the wine much more complex, much more interesting by doing that. And one of the amazing things about uh, modern technology with the cooperage, um, especially the one we work with, is that um, as the winemaker you have different uh, flavor compounds that you can pull from different toasts and different styles of barrel uh, making that um, for instance similar to the process of switching the barrels like let's just say we had a mocha barrel and a spice barrel you can pull different characteristics into the same wine through the blending of those barrels together and uh, the technology today is amazing when we're working um, with the, the barrel makers, we uh, can almost specifically say, hey, this wine that I made last year, this is the kind of characteristic that I like, and they can pull out the markers in it and identify what are the key components of the oak that they want to bring forward as the characteristics to it, and they can uh, prep the barrel just the way we want it. So, okay. Yeah, see, years ago, we'd buy barrels, and we'd buy them light toast, medium toast, maybe medium plus uh, or heavy toast. Okay. Today, all the barrels are purchased by spice uh, names. So like we buy mocha barrels, spice barrels, vanilla barrels, and those barrels have that specific flavor compound. Interesting. <clears throat> so I didn't realize that. You, I mean, I knew about the light toast and the heavy toast, and then there's, you know, how tight the grain is, and then what, what like, especially with the French oaks, if you got it from certain forest or certain grains and I'm, I know American oak is a similar idea but I never realized and, and, and each type of oak has you know American oak has certain characteristics typically in French has certain characteristics for flavor profile but I didn't realize you could really get that specific with the oaks mm -hmm. and, and that's all done by the temperature of the of the uh, of the uh, flame mm -hmm. and the duration of exposure. It's not done by, you know, taking vanilla essence and <laughs> right. it in the wood, you know, it's, it's all done how the, the barrel is toasted. And just real quick, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if you've watched, I don't know how many episodes it was, I, I talked about oak and why it's used and all that, but, you know, they, after they, after they harvest all the oak, they, they have to split it up and, and American oak is easier to work with in French as far as getting the getting the the staves put together, 
But then there's a toasting level they to do, and there's how long you do it, right, and how the temperature and all that. And then they also have to wash it before they even make it. They have to they have to season it. Right. And sit it out, and it sits outside for X number of months, years. Well, years. Yeah. All yeah. of ours are two years seasoned. So I mean, that, that there's a lot of things that I, I guess the average wine drinker doesn't realize goes into this. And again, coming out to the wineries reinforces that. Um, because you can read books, and they, they most of the books, honestly, that I have read, and, and without getting into winemaking books, really just kind of talk about the grapes, terroir, and, and and that's about it. They don't ever talk about barrels. They don't talk about yeast. They don't talk about the pruning. They don't talk about the viticulture. They don't talk about that stuff unless you get really into the winemaking stuff. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, so well, there's, um, there's 2,500 decisions that we make in every vintage. And uh, the barrels are one of the two, 2,500, so. Man, I have to say, this Primitivo, I'm still tasting it. Um, we're, we've been talking probably another couple, almost two, three minutes since I last tasted a little bit. Um, so it's got a nice long finish to it. Uh, the, the dark fruits are definitely showing through. Um, it's got that silkiness. I, I, do, I do, I find it has a silkiness to it. Um, and the acid isn't over the top. I mean, I really like this one. It's, it's really, really nice. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. And we're going to set this aside because right. we will move on to, when we get to the Zinfandel, we can definitely compare that. Pour that and the second wine we're going to have is a Bordeaux blend. And okay. uh, this one is 49% Merlot, and it is 49% Cab Sauve, and 2% Petit Verdot. <laughs> All right. And um, each year the Bordeaux blend changes. So it's not the same, you know, I hate when a winemaker uh, or someone refers to a wine as having a recipe. Right. Because there is no recipe. This is, you have to, you know, winemaking is a liquid art form. So you're basically taking the components and you're trying to maximize the end product. That's what it's all about. And like I was telling you um, in the episode with with uh, uh, Bechevel, and I don't remember if it was actually on video because I think it was we were talking before we started shooting. Uh, he had his his notebook, his uh, binder actually of all the vintages. You know, not all, I don't know how many hundreds of vintages, but at least probably the last fifty right there that he could go through. And if it was the first label or the second label. Could tell me exactly the percentages of Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, uh, and if they had any Cab Franc or they had any uh, Petit Verdot, or, or I don't think, well, they probably had Malbec. I'm not sure they used, I can't remember how much Malbec they use in it, but all the varietals in there, and like you said, I mean, it changes every year. That's what they do in Bordeaux. They, it's not a set thing mm -hmm. unless, you know, the, the, what, the handful that maybe are 100%, which I think there's only maybe a couple that do 100% of any varietal, but. They change every year, right? You know, and even when you go right bank, left bank, where there's, you know, a predominance of cab or a predominance of merlot, that can even change. You know, one year if if they're more a merlot based wine, if merlot didn't do so hot and cab did great, they'll they'll flip it. But yeah, it's every year it's different. Mm -hmm. And this th these uh, grapes come from our high plains uh, vineyards and. We, we have about uh, seven growers of Cabernet and about seven growers of Merlot. And to make Paolo, we basically taste all of the individual varieties from that season. And then we go through and rank them from one to seven. And then we uh, will keep that information for about the first six months as the wines go through the early evolution. Then we make a declaration that this is going to be a Paolo, and then it gets all this really high-end wood, and that's how it, it gets separated. Mm -hmm. So one year, the uh, Paolo could come from one vineyard, and then the next year, it could come from a different vineyard. Okay. And off the nose, um, you know, I still get, I get still those dark fruits, but I had gotten like a hint of pepper. Um, and that's when you, something I did learn, which I don't know how much I'll actually continue to do, um, but at the seminar, Israeli was like, put your hand over the glass. It was a very interesting seminar, by the way. He, he was very particular. He had, we, 
we couldn't smell before he told us to smell. We couldn't taste before he told us to taste. And we didn't get the next wine until we were already working on this wine. Then the next one would get poured. So like I've been to these other things where they poured all the wines for you and then people are like smelling and tasting even before the, they, they even start the seminar. And he was very particular and if you didn't do what he said, he called you out. But he was doing the whole like put your hand over it. And I, I remember we have, a, we have a gentleman that does that in our Psalm study group. And I just kind of thought, well, that's kind of, all right, whatever, particular, strange. And uh, so we did it in the class, and I, I find that it did enhance it. I don't know if it enhanced it as much as, 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 as Kevin said it enhanced it, but it did enhance it so you can get that little extra. So I'd gotten that little hint of pepper on the second, mm -hmm. on the second smell, so I tried to enhance a little bit, and it was still there. So um, that, that's, one of those, that's one of those little aromas I, I do love getting in wine. And you kind of expect that from uh, Cab. Right. From the Cab, you really want to get a little bit of that black pepper, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and the idea of putting a hand over it and, and shaking it is totally <coughs> acceptable, as right. long as you can firmly yes. keep your hand just, over the Yeah, top. it was funny because he was like, he was saying something like, well, when you go out there and do the tasting, uh, make sure you do that because you're, you're, you're washing your glass. I'm like, okay, well. And, he, and then, he, then he, we were doing this. Anyone have wine on their hand? I was like, no, actually, I don't. So I did a good job of swirling. <laughs> <laughs> Got to make sure your hands are clean, too. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, get some funk in there. Yeah, we don't, want, we don't want that extra funk. I mean, if it's already in the wine, that's fine. But we don't need any extra funk in there. Do you want me to get inventory? Uh, no, we're good. We're good. Because I, I, I had opened these up about mm -hmm. an hour before you came, so they have been breathing, they, you know, and that always helps. Uh, th these wines that are, you know, have given a great deal of oak, uh, really complex wines, do benefit from aeration. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Um, simple wines typically don't benefit much from aeration, but the more complex the wine gets, because the thing that I find amazing is that if we go back to these wines two hours from now, they will taste or smell even different, more different. Right. You know, it, it, they, they are living, breathing uh, products, and uh, and it's amazing. Uh, that's why it's nice to nurture this over a meal, you know, because it really does oh, yeah. enhance everything. It, um, I, I really enjoy doing that with wine and, and drinking it over an hour or two period of time rather than just you know popping the bottle and just and just and downing the wine mm -hmm. um yeah it's um uh, it's it's definitely a good way it, it, it's you see it you notice it. and even when i'll do my reviews even in the in the matter of 10 minutes you know if if uh right. if especially if i pour more wine into there into the glass there's i can see those differences um with this wine I still get more of those dark fruits, a um, little bit higher in the acid for me. Uh, nothing wrong with that. It's uh, really nice. Um, I really love the aromas on this one. The, the wood expression on this wine is really amazing. It, it's, you can really pick up the French wood smells. Right. And, uh, it's really lovely. Uh, one of the things that I find amazing about this wine, we have done this Bordeaux blend up against um, some of the highest end Bordeaux blend wines out of California and even French. Mm -hmm. And I would say we've probably done it 10, maybe 20 times. And every single time this wine is chosen as the French wine or the California Bordeaux blend, you know? So, you know, and one of the pet peeves that I have about, about what people say about Texas wine is that we're not, we, we can't grow the uh, major varietals like Cabernet Merlot, uh, Zinfandel, you know, we're fine on some of these lesser known varietals. Well, I would say out of the 35 years that we've existed, uh, we have probably literally thousands of awards on the major varietals. So we have found that to be completely untrue. We can grow Cab, we can grow Merlot, we can grow Pinot, we can grow Zinfandel. So uh, Texas, I think, has all the potential to grow pretty much whatever we want to grow. So. Uh, well, if you think about it, I mean, I, I understand where, where they come from with that because I, I, do, I do believe that you shouldn't try to grow a grape that won't grow well in an area. Okay? Absolutely. Right. Um, but I think in some ways we have to remember that Texas is huge. 
I mean, you know, the whole the whole you know, ad campaign ad campaign is a whole another country. I mean, it, it's it is as big as many wine growing countries out there, and just because the high plains. Uh, you grow wine out, you grow grapes out there, you grow grapes out in the hill country, or you're growing grapes up in North Texas. And you know, we have quite a few areas that we're growing grapes, and even out here in East Texas, um, you're going to have different, completely different climates, completely different soils. So it's not like, it's not like, you know, in France or in Italy where, uh, you're necessarily growing grapes that normally grow up in Bordeaux. That you're growing in, you're growing in Burgundy. Um, you could probably grow them. You could probably make wine. It may not be as good as the Bordeaux right. grapes, but you're, you're able to do it. But you know, being able to identify in areas of Texas where these grapes are are successful is is important. And I know we're still, you know, especially the the lesser known grapes, we're still figuring out, mm -hmm. you know. Where the Tempranillos are good, where the right. uh, Viognier's are good, and I've been I've tasted some of those, and I've been really I've been really um, uh, pleased with the results on on those lesser known varieties. Absolutely. You know, um, but yeah, it's, it's it is a matter of making sure that everything is uh, grown in the proper area. Mm -hmm. Now this is an amazing wine. I, um, I I do get all that nice pepper uh, on the palate. Um, it's really smooth. Um, still get that silkiness it's, it's really really nice really really nice thank you <clears throat> what we have found is north of Lubbock is a lot like Burgundy okay uh, you've got your Pinot Noirs your Chardonnays uh, your Rieslings your Gewürztraminers those things seem to do better north of Lubbock okay south of Lubbock is really like Bordeaux and so the Cabs the Merlots uh, uh, seem to do really well there and the difference in bud break from La Mesa, which is the bottom of the of the Cap Rock, up to Plainview, which is close to the top, is almost three to four weeks difference in bud break. Okay. And yet it's about a hundred and uh, maybe a hundred and five miles difference from one end to the other, but it has that much of a difference in bud break. And, and I just just as a person that's grown up in Texas, um, we talk about bud break, so. There's obviously a difference in climate, enough of a difference in climate, even just when I lived growing up in San Antonio and you know, watching the weathermen and they talk about Austin, mm -hmm. which is about an hour away from where I lived. Mm -hmm. You know, there you can see that there's a different climate. I mean, there's a basic similarity in climate, but there is, but there there is, and I think we're just because San Antonio lies and there's this line right north of San Antonio that like it never snows, where Austin maybe gets snow. A little bit more often, but not a lot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. But there's there's definitely a, an air, you know part of that area of Texas where there's a um, a major uh, or at least enough of a difference in climate right. that you can notice it. Um, let's move on to the next one. While okay. we're doing that, I'm gonna change the battery in that light because <laughs> I don't have a light shining on me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we'll move on to the next wine. We'll grab uh, these. And yes, just as a, uh, a note, I never stop recording. There is no such thing as editing on my show. <laughs> <laughs> because you know what? I, I had no problem showing the faults and mistakes. Now I have done things where I may have started and I made a mistake in the very like 30 seconds, the first 30 seconds of an episode, and then I will start over. And anytime I do that, I say that I had a second take. All right. So now we have. So now we're in we're back Cabernet to Franc. Nice. The father of Cabernet Sauvignon. That's right. Uh, it is a variety that we've been making since 1991. Uh, for the first 10 years, people thought we misspelled Sauvignon uh, <laughs> because they had no idea what Franc, uh, Cabernet Franc was. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people are asking for Cabernet Franc. It, it's probably, pound for pound, the most awarded wine that we make. Uh, it has won all sorts of uh, awards at the uh, San Antonio Rodeo, the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. It's won a lot in L.A. and uh, San Francisco. It, it, it has done really well for us. The, I love the grape because it's so um, earthy. It, you know, I, I feel like you smell this wine and you smell shiitakes. You know, it's just a portobello in a glass. It's just wonderful. 
silky, wonderful. We grow it up in the Texoma mm -hmm. region of the state. We're up on the Red River. Red dirt, uh, four miles from the river, four miles from the border of Texas and Oklahoma. This is one of my favorite varietals. So, which you may have noticed in that video from the last video, I may have mentioned that. <laughs> Steve made sure when we were doing our little pre interview, I mentioned something about, oh, maybe that was, maybe I didn't mention Cobb Franc to him. I think it was um, Zinfandel I had mentioned to him. So he made sure to do some Zin with me. But I think the Cobb Franc was like, he said, we're going to do this. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I really like the nose too. Um, getting a lot of spice on it. Mm. You know, our, our goal is to create wines that are complex, that are soft. You know, we don't like wines that are so puckery mm -hmm. that it puts people off. Because, you know, we have a lot of Texas wine lovers that like wines that are approachable. And that's, that's our objective, is to make approachable wines. This is a blend, 89% Cab Franc and 11% Cab Sauv. In the same vineyard, uh, he also grows Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. Mm. But it's a, a lovely example of Cab Franc. You know, as we travel in Europe, especially, and especially in uh, the Bordeaux region, a lot of those wines have a lot of Cabernet Franc in them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, many people think that uh, the Bordeaux Wines are basically Merlot and Cab, but there's right. a lot of Cab Franc in them. And and on this, lots of pepper. I love pepper. I love I love getting that off of a wine. Um, and you're getting the fruits, so it's a great marriage between the between the fruits and the pepper on the palate. Um, as always, I just love Cab Franc, and it's it's it is a favorite. It's it has become you know my first favorite was in my second favorite has become. Uh, Cab Franc, and uh, on the red side now, Brunello has become <laughs> another favorite of mine. Um, it doesn't hurt to, to have had that happen, but um, that little event. But you know, this is just I love the spiciness of it, and I think that's probably why I like Zin and, and Cab Franc is there's there's a spiciness to the wine. Because um, I had gotten asked about you know someone said what's your favorite wine? I said well Zinfandel, and I, I tend to just I tend to go by grapes, not necessarily by labels. Um, I, I think that's when somebody goes, well, what's your favorite wine? I'm like, oh, well, I like Zinfandels a lot. And they kind of look at me and say, well, I want to know who. Like, as long as they make a good Zinfandel, I'm not really worried about it. But um, then also, okay, well, I've had these Zins from these people that have been good. So I try to remember who, who it was. Um, but, you know, the, the, I think it's because of that, that spice, uh, the spiciness of, of those wines. That's what I really like about them. One of the things that... Um you know, we get questions sometimes as to what Palo is. I think mm -hmm. that uh, it's important <clears throat> to, to kind of understand the general concept behind Palo. Of course, Palo signifies the winemaker. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way that the Palo wine is created starts from kind of the beginning of that 2500 uh, decision process. From the very beginning, uh, you know, we're interfacing with the grapes and the wine. Those lots that we consider to be the best quality are, are um, you know, when you made the comment about the keeping the, the journal with the different, well, I think our journal is probably like 20 or 30,000 pages of paper because we right. make so many, so many notes on every single lot as far as like what the quality level is and where we feel the progression is, how it's matured, um, the decisions that go along with the winemaking process, what barrels that it gets selected for. And so as soon as a lot is, is deemed as being Palo quality, from that point on, it's basically treated with like the top quality, the best barrels that we have, um, the, the the most attention, it gets the most attention in the cellar, um, all the way up to the bottling. So, and that's one of the reasons why it's in our most premium package with the um, printed bottles that really signify um, kind of the the best uh, quality grapes and uh, wine that we have. So. Um, and then it goes into a, a wooden box, mm -hmm. so it is packed in a six-pack, and it's in a wooden box, and it's beautiful. And one thing that's been, in my mind, a very good sign of the health of the Texas industry as far as on the consumer end is that um, over the last year, our sales of Palo have tripled. Um, 
and if actually if not quadrupled, right. close to quadrupled. And I think that that shows the fact that we are moving into a, a stage where Texans are are ready to start, you know, buying ultra premium level wines because they started to appreciate the quality that the Texas industry can produce. So that's very exciting. Well, in both our location here and in Fredericksburg, right, our number one selling group is Palo. Mm -hmm. So well, and and on premise and restaurants, especially in the Houston and Austin area, we're starting to sell a lot of Palo, mm -hmm. which is once again a very healthy sign. Mm -hmm. And and do you think that um, that's I know for you that you've had those you've had that increase in sales. Um, that's also industry wide, right? You you feel like really the, the, the winemakers are really getting kind of, uh, especially um, the quality that they're, it, it, it's, it's kind of like really everyone's really getting to that point where they're, they're getting, uh, getting better, better quality out of it. Right, well in the vineyards, I mean the growers are getting a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, the growers understand what it takes to produce a ultra premium uh, uh, wine mm -hmm. and uh, so it's really a cooperative joint venture. Everything that's happening, everything that we're doing is premium. Everything the grower is doing premium. Uh, our educational system in the state in terms of educating growers has gotten much better. So, you know, and, the, and the, the, as Paul was saying, the consumer is accepting of the fact that, of course, they make premium wine, you know. Whereas uh, back 35 years ago, I mean, they, we had to get over the fact that we even made wine. Uh, so now, and, and we ship more of this to California, hmm. probably, other than Texas, than any other state we ship to California, so. Yeah. <clears throat> You're talking about the educational side, and um, with the High Plains, uh, Texas Tech, they, uh, from my understanding, they, they, they've got some viticultural programs, right? They've got viticulture <laughs> and enology. Okay, and how about A&M, which is right down the road? Uh, are they, are they, I mean, they're, they're an agricultural school basically, well not basically, I mean that's what they, you know, that's right. what the A start, stands for, <laughs> um, and mechanical. Um, I almost went there by the way, uh, ended up, ended up looking horns, but <laughs> I didn't wear the longhorn hat today. Um, but, um, well, you, you notice that we make only maroon and white wine, you yeah, know that, yeah, right? I know, I know. But, <laughs> but we are an equal opportunity winery, I want you to know that also. Uh, but A and M does have classes in in f fruit science more okay. than anything else. It's multi fruit. Okay. Uh, but they have a couple of classes in uh, wine making and wine appreciating. Okay. Uh, but Tech has a formal program, right. and Grayson Community College has degrees in viticulture and enology as well. Oh, very cool, very cool. And then you were telling me uh, uh, that the. Uh Villa was actually an architectural project, right? For for the A and M students, right? A and M students. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, probably at any in any semester we probably have 10, 12 uh, interns from A and M nice. on, on the property. So uh, you know we, we are a learning center here. We we we. I mean, r right now probably if we snapshotted uh, Messina Hoff alumni in the wine industry, I bet we have a hundred that are working in the wine industry someplace in the United States. Oh, very cool. Very one, cool. And one thing that is um, also kind of a sign of change in, in the times is um, internships from Texas A&M for students that are interested in, in viticulture. Um, in the past, there's been a little bit of, of interest, but mm -hmm. this, the last year or two, we've actually had a lot of people who are interested in learning about viticulture. So I think we've had close to eight interns that have come through during their schooling and even though they're, obviously their degree is not in viticulture, they want to focus on that as that's their awesome. primary focus. That's, that's awesome. That's what we need. We have to have a, a future uh, group of people that are going to carry the industry forward. Yeah. yeah, we need our version of UC Davis. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Sure do. All right, we'll move on to the next one. And of course, the next light went out, and this was about <laughs> to go out, so I'll just change the battery on both of those. So I'll get these glasses here real quick. Thank you. Go. Remember the Zin, and there's the Primitivo. There go. <clears throat> now, for those of you watching, you're about to see the camera shake a little bit. Because one of the lights is actually right in front of the camera. Well, pour the Primitivo back in. And this one's about to 
fade Which out. Which one is so your primitive? This is my primitive. Voila, we have light again. I think his primitivo is that one, right? Yeah, this is my primitivo right here. So pour a little more primitivo. I'll refer to that afterwards. Here, we'll do that. This is your... Uh, That's your Zen. This is the Zen? Okay. All right. Primitive on the left and Zen on the right. And I, I, to me, I find it fascinating because technically these are supposed to be so close. Right. You know, there's just a, a hair difference in their genetic makeup. And yet, on the vine, they look different. They, they, uh, um, Primitivo is easier to grow than Zinfandel. Zinfandel has a tendency to be so big in the cluster and so tight that uh, they ooze sometimes. They'll actually right. burst. Uh, Primitivo is a little bit more manageable. Uh, and they smell different, they taste different. But so. And, I and love, they do. I love both of them, but, but they are different. There's no doubt about it. Look at that. Double swirl right there. Um, <laughs> double swirl without the table. Okay. <laughs> and you know, the Primitivo, it, it's, it's so, first of all, it's already evolved in the glass and evolved in the bottle. And now I get this great caramel out of it mm -hmm. on the Primitivo. It's just, it's just phenomenal. You know, they're, they're both great pasta wines, there's no doubt about it. Um, right. And I think they're both good steak wines. Uh, and the thing that I love about Zinfandel and Primitivo is that the people who like them become fanatics. I mean, they really like yeah. them, I mean, you know. Well, one of the biggest obstacles that we've had for the last 20 years is people would say, well, I'd like a Zinfandel, and you'd pour them this, and they'd say, why isn't it pink? So that was our first <laughs> obstacle, is to, is to teach people that this is actually the way the wine has been for hundreds of years. It, the white Zinfandel was an adaptation, it's a rosé basically, right? that happened in the late 70s, early 80s. So, uh, but this is, the, the, the good Lord I think intended Zinfandel to be like this. And my introduction to Zinfandel was, I was at a, um, a place I used to go to after work all the time in Chicago, and I wasn't really into wine. I mean, I had liked it, but there was nothing like spectacular yet for me. I mean, the Syrah, Shiraz grape, I liked those wines, um, but it wasn't like, it was the first, that was the first grape to really kind of get me started into it, but Zin was the one that really like turned, they flipped the switch, and I remember going into the, going into the bar, it was a bar restaurant, um, Dublin's by the way, so you ever in Chicago you go to Dublin's, it's phenomenal food, and the, the, I swear the kitchen is about two, the, the, the cooking area is about twice the size of the table, and that's it. <laughs> and, and it's a small place, I mean, it's about as big as this room, and, uh, and they, they serve phenomenal food there. But um, the, the, the bartender, you know, was all proud about giving me this Zinfandel, she goes, this is the original Zinfandel. I'm like, oh, okay, and I, about my knowledge of Zinfandel is white Zinfandel. And so she went through the whole thing about, you know, this is blah, blah, blah. And she kind of got, she was mostly right. Or, you know, she, she got the basic of it, basic idea of it. And I fell in love with it. And again, I mean, this, you know, I've got great dark fruit. Got the spice. And the Zen Vineyard was planted in 1984. And it is uh, owned by... Merrill, Merrill owns the vineyard. It's Merrill's vineyard where we grow in, and then also the Bell Brothers. Mm -hmm. And the Bell Brothers, uh, you know, are friends. They manage our vineyard up there in the High Plains. Fabulous people, and uh, it's in a town called Halfway, Texas. And people ask me, you know, what, what is what halfway? And I said, yeah, it's halfway to nowhere. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> It's actually, if you take Plainview and go to the New Mexico border, plain, uh, halfway is about actually a quarter of the way to the New Mexico border. But it's a, a beautiful place to grow grapes, beautiful soil, deep, deep soils. It's a very cool place up there. Um, they probably get uh, five snows a year. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, tonight it'll be in the 20s over there. So, And uh, on, on the pallet, 
you know, some, again, the dark fruits, but some great spices and some pepper. Now, all, the, all the things that I like about, I like about Zen are right here. So now you can see the difference between Zen and Primitivo. They're, they're different. Uh, they're subtle differences, uh, but they are, they are different. I'm really digging the Primitivo. Isn't that nice? Oh, yeah. It's just really lovely. It is. It is awesome. <clears throat> All right, so let's see what we got next here. Now we're going to taste something that uh, uh, we started in 1996, okay. and it's called the Star of Texas. All right. It's a line of wine that we uh, produce only in exceptional years and, um, and only in very limited quantity. And uh, what we do is we pick out one or two barrels only and uh, bottle it. So these are very, very rare. They're very special. Um, these are the wines that when you're comparing this to Opus One or you're comparing it to Silver Oak, this is the one. Okay. And uh, it's just a really big volume wine. Uh, and it, this one's a blend of 80% cap. 10% Merlot and 10% Cap Franc. Okay, and the years that you do make this, it it will be, it it it's it could be any, it's it's not like a cab based. No wine. It, well, it, no, this one is the this cab. one is this is the cab, but we also make a Merlot. Okay. We also make a Bordeaux blend. We only do those three. Okay. And we may not do one for three or four years. Only when I really feel like we we have something exceptional here. And this is 2009, right? This is 2009. But this, the, you know, the wood smells on this mm -hmm. is just... Yeah, I'm getting like this great better. cedar box, you know. And one of the things I love to do with this, I got these, uh, these are our port truffles. Right. Has a little bit of port on the inside. I want you to taste the wine first. Okay. Then I want you to take a bite of the uh, of the chocolate, and then taste it again, and you'll see how this it they are harmony. This is good. <laughs> Smooth got great fruit to it, you know, great spice. I mean, this is, this is, you know, they use the word balance a lot in, in, in reviewing wines and talking about wines, you know, and this, and, and not that these don't have that balance, but this, this really, I mean, you, there is a difference. There really is a great balance between the fruit, the acid, the tannins, uh, the spices, everything that, you know, is, is coming together, you know. And I can see where you're going with this. I mean, like I said, this is, this is, you're able to put this up against those Opus ones, mm -hmm. you know? Now we're gonna try with the chocolate, because besides that, just loving chocolate, <laughs> you gotta put it with, you know, great wine, right? And it has a port mousse on the inside. Mm -hmm. That's right. Just the chocolate alone is awesome. <laughs> I mean, really. And this uh, chocolate is actually made uh, just south of Fredericksburg. Mm. Yeah, did they use your port yes. mm -hmm. for the mousse? Mm -hmm. We also have a white chocolate um, Moscato truffle. Really? That we nice. Sell in, that we sell in Fredericksburg. Yeah, everything we do is wine integrated. So every dish here at the restaurant has our wine in it. All of our food products have our wine in it. And all of our food products are made in Texas and they, uh, we partner with the Texas producer and then we will give them our wine and they'll, they'll integrate it in with the, with the uh, food product. An absolutely incredible combination here. I mean, <clears throat> again, talk about the, the last week's episode um, and Israeli was you know, saying wine enhances the food and the mm -hmm. food enhances the wine. Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect example of, of that. I mean, he, and it's not, like, it's not like he's the only one that said that, you know, but 
to have him say that on camera, you know, just lends that little more credibility that I've already been saying it. You know, it's like, yeah, see, I was right. But, um, you know, really, I mean, this is something where, you know, food and wine really do go together. Uh, I can be somebody that could, I, I could just drink this by itself. And there are people out there who'd be like, that's sacrilegious. How could you just drink that wine with no food? It's, a, you know, <laughs> you've got to pair food with the wine. I could, and I'm a person that can just drink wine on its own. But I recognize that when I have food with it, it really enhances the experience. And that's something that, you know, you, you really have to think about is, you know, and some wines really, really beg to be paired with food. Um, and other wines, yeah, you, you could, you're quaffable. They, you could just sit on the, on the porch, like, we're, like in the villa, you know, sitting on the back, sitting, sitting in, the, you know, in the villas in, in the back there, which, um, and sipping some wine at night. You know, you could put food with it or you just, you know, enjoy it. You know, especially some like the, your, your, your white wines, your Moscatos during the summer. You know, a, a great way to just kind of cool off or like the bow I had. Um, right. Which was was an absolute pleasant surprise, and, and really because it wasn't the stereotypical Texas sweet red, it really was more like a Beaujolais. Right. It really was meant to be, and, and I and I I'm kind of feel embarrassed I didn't make the connection before I even tasted the wine, and then smelled it, and it was kind of like, and I, I smelled it, and I I remember thinking about the name Beau, I was like, oh, duh, Beaujolais, okay, <laughs> you know. Um, it was in that style of wine. Well, it had a, another name. It yes, was, it was. It was originally called Gamay Beaujolais. Two thousand seven, the French disallowed the use of Bo Gamay Beaujolais, so we decided to trademark Beaujolais, and we trademarked it. Uh, and then the French government contacted me and said, "We will be suing you for <laughs> using that term." So we negotiated an eighteen-month settlement. And after 18 months, we stopped using the term Beaujolais and started calling it Beau. What was interesting, as soon as we started calling it Beau, sales went up 400%. <laughs> so, using... Just, maybe could, what, the, the consumer probably it liked was, that name? It was easier. Yeah. It was just easier. You know, I, I don't think the average person who's drinking that wine even knows, uh, you know, what a Beaujolais is supposed to taste like. But uh, they sure like the name Bo, and right. they've been buying it ever since. <laughs> that was that was definitely something. Again, you know, we're, we're referencing what I would edit a couple days ago, last week, um, was um, just talking about in the industry and uh, being in restaurants and, and going to your staff. You know, you you have young staff. You know, they're college students or just out of college, and trying to get them to sell some of your wine and and say, trying to help them pronounce things. And, and Italy is the, is the example. Everyone knows how to say Italy. Everyone knows, everyone knows how to say Tuscany. Mm -hmm. Everyone you know, knows how to say Brunello, but maybe Brunello di Montalcino is a little bit more difficult wow. for, for your average American kid to, unless they grew up back East or an Italian family, they, they don't, even I struggle with Italian pronunciations. You know, my parents laugh at me, you know, because they grew up in there. My mother's not Italian, but she, she grew up in, in that area. And, they laugh at me when I when I still completely butcher Italian pronunciations. <laughs> so it, it's it's something where having you know for just marketability, having something that's easy to say um, from just not from your standpoint, from from say a retailer or a restaurateur, you know be, it's easier to do that rather than like uh, you know Gewurztraminer. <laughs> what? <laughs> G your words, uh, what? I don't know. I don't get that. You know. We call it the G wine. The G wine. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, I, I went. I remember going to a, a, a restaurant, and I had just picked up on uh, on a way to say, uh, or or like a short shorthand way of saying Gruner Veltliner or Liner or whatever it is. <laughs> she was calling it GV, and and I was in a restaurant where it was you know good you know a nice restaurant, good wine list. They had a Gruner on there, and say, instead of saying Gruner, I was like, I want to get a glass of your GV. And the guy's like, what? I was like, well, that's shorthand for Gruner Veltliner. He's like, oh, I've never heard that before. And I thought, wow, maybe it was just that I was just making, I mean, I had somebody else that <laughs> said it, so I picked it up from somebody else. And it's years later now, realizing that if I just said Gruner, he would have known what I meant. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it does, like I said, I think the, the, the GV, unusual. it'll stick. GV will stick. I like GV. GSM is a very popular yes. category. And if you pronounced all of those grapes, 
nobody would buy it. Right. You know, so GSM makes sense. Uh, you know, GV, I think, makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if he has used that afterwards, because this is probably like three or four years ago. I think I, I, was, I was in Austin at a restaurant. And they had it, which again, you know, on a wine list is very unusual to see that to begin with. Uh -huh. So I see it on a wine list. I see something that's not normal. I, I will immediately gravitate towards it. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, this is, um, yeah, obviously all the wines are wonderful. And we got one more. Oh, we got one more. We're, one oh, more. And this oh, you is, have that hidden behind. And this oh, is, yes, you just bottled this. Well, we just bottled it, but this is something that I'm so proud of my son, Paul, because this was his project from inception. And uh, why don't you talk about it? Because it's gorgeous. Show off the label. I mean, the label is oh, unbelievable. Yes. And I'll get pictures of these. Make sure I get pictures of these labels uh -huh. um, so I can interject them into the video. We've been making Angel since 1984. It is the only Texas wine that ever got a 90 in the Spectator in 1990. Uh, but Angel's been with us so long, it needed some revitalization, so that's what Paul did. And, you know, on the second generation of winemakers in our Messinaha family, this is what you get. You get revitalization, and you get enthusiasm in taking a very well-known brand and kind of giving it uh, a lot of energy. Well, and similar to what I was talking about before with the Paolo, how we wanted to make the the package special so that it stood out and people recognize the fact that there's something unique there. Um, you know, we, we are in the middle of a, uh, of a label change kind of across the board um, to be able to stand out more on the shelf so that people can identify our products, but really especially with the, with the Angel, um, also with our Mistella, which is a, a late harvest uh, Moscow Canelli. But with the, with the Angel uh, being the late harvest Riesling, it's something that we've had for a very long time. Um, and it's been a product that really, there, there's, a, there's a lot of, of, um, of fans out there of it that are, you know, we get requests all the time of, hey, you know, where's your Angel? I'd, I'd like to find a location that carries it. And so the thought process was, is that we want to make a package that stand out so broadly in the marketplace that anybody can tell that's the Messina Hoff Angel, the package. And so we decided to move with the blue bottle, we right. move with the angel wings. And the, the, the thing that's, the reason why we have angels and cherubs is um, if you go over to our retail room on the front face of the building, there are two fountains. And then those fountains are uh, cherubs carved into the wall. And so that has become really a cornerstone of who we are as a company and that, you know, that it fits in with our, with our logo and our, with our, our general image. But we wanted to take that image, keep the same concept of the, uh, the wings and move to a, a more modern looking package. And that's, so that, that's what we want with this. This is an awesome bottle. And literally this was bottled today, right? Or was this bottled? No, it's being bottled again Again today, again today. right, yes. So. That's why I was all excited because, you know, Paul had let me know that they were about to start bottling this and was talking about the bottle, so I wanted to see it. And uh, this is an awesome bottle. Now, this says late harvest, okay? So is this, is this in the, like, the German tradition of something like a, like a, we'll see, we'll see, a Baron Trocken or? Yeah, Trocken Baron Okay. Yeah, it, th this did not freeze on the vine. Right. But it was picked as the last pick. Okay. And I think the bricks at harvest was like 26. What, 26. Yeah. So it was very intense, very sweet, almost like honey. Okay. Well, and you can really pick up the late harvest characteristics from the wine as mm -hmm. well. And it, it's a 2012. And already, every competition we've entered it in has won best of class. So it's, it's an exceptional uh, wine. And, and one of the things that I love about Riesling is that people think of Texas as hot. And they think of Germany as cold. So how could you grow Riesling, <laughs> right? And Riesling grows really well in Texas. It really, really does well. I think pound for pound, over the 35 years that we've been making wine, Riesling has been the most consistent producer of grapes in the state. 
Every year, I think we had one miss uh, harvest. Every year we've had a, a Riesling harvest. This is really nice and it's sweet, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, it even says it's heavenly sweet on the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. But it, it doesn't feel like it's like just syrupy and just like really, really just nastily sweet. Um, it, it's it's, it's a, a nice, even sweetness to it. You know, it, it's it's really beautiful. You know, it's great. And of course the bottle's awesome, <clears throat> you know, so this is some good stuff. You know, the goal in, in producing wine, I think, is to make it visually attractive. Mm -hmm. And it starts with the bottle. So you start with a beautiful bottle, and then you put beautiful wine in a beautiful bottle, and you've got a great product. So, well, and especially in the market that we live in today, there's just so many options out there, and so to be able to stand out is, is key. Right. It's very important. Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, this has been a great experience, um, which I, I didn't expect anything less. I, you know, after going to Fredericksburg and working with Steve, um, I was expect you know totally expecting to getting a similar experience here, and it's been wonderful. Um, the wines are great. Uh, if you're in the Texas area, yeah, the Hill Country is you know everybody goes to the Hill Country, you know, and but. You do need to come out to this area, um, especially if you're visiting Houston. It, it's about two hours to drive up here, and I admit I was going pretty fast. But I found some people that were, I found some people to follow. Um, I mean, I left it was rush hour when I left, so um, it took it took me about an hour and a little over an hour and a half. Right, and that and I was I was I was hoofing it to get here, but um, you know it's about an hour and a half, two hour drive, and. Um, but it's totally worth it to come out here. I mean, the facility is beautiful. Um, you get some great wine out here. You guys are awesome. Every, and everybody else I've met has, has been wonderful. And, um, you know, absolutely, you know, check out the wines. Check out the facility. And uh, you got some vineyards back here. I don't know if you heard it. I don't know if you can tell. But it's windy as all whatever <laughs> out there. Um, and uh, so I'm glad we're in here because mm -hmm. it's not that it's freezing out there, but it's a little windy. It's a little chilly. <laughs> I didn't bring a jacket for the trip. I thought it was going to be like 70s the whole week, the whole time. I get out of the car, well, I get out of the hotel, I'm like, it's like 50. I'm like, it's not that cold, but I thought it would be a little bit warmer, you know? But um, yeah, it's awesome, and I really appreciate uh, Well, we your appreciate time. you coming. Yes. Oh, yes. A toast? Absolutely, a toast. And uh, it's a success in the Texas wine industry. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Well, folks, as always, thank you for stopping by. Click the links above to friend me. Uh, click the links below for Messina Hoff. Leave comments. And uh, again, thank you for stopping by. We'll see everyone again next time. All right.